Hello everyone, I'm Gabby Starr, president of Pomona College, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the second in our series of distinguished uh, speaker dialogues with people from around the country. While many of us are looking ahead to our nation bridging the divides that have separated us over the past several years, it's gonna take a lot of hard work and it's not gonna be easy. We're gonna to have to have uncomfortable conversations that challenge entrenched attitudes and beliefs and if we're to be successful, we must listen to and learn from one another and work together to build a better nation and a better world. Joining us for this conversation is Rabbi Sharon Brouse, senior and founding rabbi of Congregation Car here in Los Angeles. She's a leading voice in reanimating religious life in America and an advocate for engaging in multi-faith work as a solution for injustice. Her 2016 TED Talk, Reclaiming Religion, which offers faith of all kinds as a hopeful counter-narrative to the numbing realities of violence, extremism, and pessimism, has been viewed more than 1.4 million times and has been translated into 23 languages. In this talk, she says that as religious leaders, it's our job to make people uncomfortable. It's our job to wake people up, to pull them out of their apathy and into the anguish, and to insist that we do what we don't want to do and see what we do not want to see. Rabbi Rouse, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for helping us to see new paths and new possibilities and not to turn away from those things that disturb us, cause us anguish, and ultimately can transform who we are and who we are for each other. So I'm gonna get started with asking you a few questions. Um, so as a faith leader, I know that a big part of your work has been to advocate for ideals of democracy. So could you talk a little bit about the varying relationships between the state, whether um, it's the state in general or the United States and religious institutions and religious leaders? Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you so much, President Starr. I'm so honored to be here with you and love that you're doing this speaker series and learning how to hold space for the really critical conversations, especially in this time um, when we're all so isolated from one another physically. And I think potentially also spiritually uh, feeling a deep and profound sense of isolation and disconnect. So I'm really grateful to be here with you and be part of this conversation. Part of what I think is happening in our country right now is that we are experiencing um, a, a real moral crisis. And what we're seeing is that there's not just a massive political rift that's been forming in the country, but that there's a real question about what path America might follow as we begin the next chapter of our history together. Will this be a moment of reckoning in which we're able to actually name and do some truth telling around the pain points of the past, the real traumas and scars of the past and learn how together to heal and rebuild? Or is this gonna be a time in which we're gonna to continue to barrel uh, in a direction that continues to isolate, to alienate and to further entrench in, in a really pessimistic and cynical politics that gives power to the few uh, at the expense of the many. And so part of what I understand the role of faith leaders and faith communities to be in this time is to be part of naming that moral crisis and part of the, uh, the cultural shift that actually has to take place in order for this awakening to be recognized and embraced as an opportunity for real transformation in our country. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fellow at uh, one of the Auburn Senior Fellows at, at Auburn Seminary in New York with this really extraordinary collection of multi-faith, multi-racial leaders from around the country. And they have an incredible motto to the seminary, which is trouble the waters, heal the world. And I love thinking about faith leaders and faith communities as the ones who are called to trouble the waters and to heal the world, to offer the kind of spiritual nourishment that we're going to need to engage in the long struggle toward a, a more inclusive, more just, and more loving society. That um, reminds me very much of um, the idea of good trouble. Right? That, that perhaps that's that's what we what we need to seek. When you you were just speaking now about uh, troubling the waters uh, and um, the role of, of faith leaders and spirituality there. I was struck by the degree to which many college campuses are, are highly secular uh, and are, are proudly secular. 
Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between secular institutions like many colleges or secular institutions like, um, like democracies and how you, that tension between um, faith ideals or religious practice um, can work productively or unproductively? So I think we have to ask the question of what is at the heart of your faith commitment. Is at the core of your faith commitment the, the, the pressing need, the determination to convince somebody else to believe the way that you do? Or is it to demonstrate a sense of obligation or responsibility to other human beings in creating a just and loving society? So for me, I have a very real and very profound relationship with the Holy One. I, I believe in God. I pray three times a day. I have a really sacred practice of Shabbat um, that, that nothing can interfere with, frankly. Um, but my primary interest is not in convincing other people to believe in God the way that I do, to worship and to practice the way that I do, but instead to understand that at the heart of my faith, like at the heart of many faith traditions, is the commitment that all human beings are created in the image of the Holy One and therefore deserve to live with freedom, deserve to live with integrity, deserve to live in dignity. And so our faith commitments should lead us to be better citizens. It's not ultimately about compelling or coercing other people to believe the way that we do, but rather to be part of an awakening that helps create a different kind of discourse around what the social order could actually look like and how we how we can hold responsibility toward one another in a collective, whether that collective is a family unit or a community or a society. What are my obligations toward the poor? What are my obligations toward the vulnerable? Who do I see and who do I choose not to see? And, and when you live in a, in a faith community that offers as a framework the essential principle that every single life is precious and that all people are created in God's image, then what matters most is not necessarily the way you pray or what you eat or if you drive or walk on Saturday, but what matters most is, is how you engage those who are most in need, uh, who are most vulnerable and, and, who, and whose lives really need to be lifted up in the full light and in the full dignity. You point out several really fascinating things and uh, what you just said. And I want to zero in on one of them, which is um, the difference, the distinction between dialogue and argument uh, and belief and convincing. Because one of the things I'm struck by is we spend a lot of time in college teaching people how to argue or helping them to marshal their facts to get um, all of those steps of convincing someone else that they are right in order. And you've pointed out that there, that's not what your goal is, to convince them that you are right in terms of your faith. So could you talk a little bit about what you're trying to convince people of? So part of it is this value of, of human life. Um, but I think they're also embedded in what you said, some rules or recommendations or thoughts about the difference between dialogue and argumentation and conversation and um, uh, the rough and tumble of disputation. Yeah, I come from a tradition that really lifts up and honors uh, dialogue, discourse, and even really fierce, we call it machloket in Hebrew, but fierce dispute in an effort to try to, to, try to identify what the truth is. Um, and the, the Talmud is famously known for recording dissenting opinions, even when all of the rabbis end up ruling one way, the Talmud recorded almost 2000 years ago, um, will we'll always offer the minority opinion, the minority view. Because the, the, the principle is that you just don't know. At the end of the day, we have to hold humility and we have to hold grace when we disagree with each other because we don't ultimately know what the truth is. And, and, and like Justice Ginsburg said, you plant the dissent not to convince somebody that in the here and now that they're wrong, but because one day a future generation might hear a dissenting view and might, might see the light in it in a way that the current generation could not. So my tradition really lifts up the idea of dispute and disagreement, l'shem shemaim, for the sake of, of, of trying to get closer to what the greatest truth is. 
And we're taught that when we engage in that kind of disagreement, we have to engage with both compassion and humility. That's really essential. And, and there, the rabbinic tradition is full of these stories and examples and, uh, and references about how you should, you should make a great opening in your ear so that you can hear all different kinds of views and perspectives, even those that you really disagree with. However, there are boundaries to those conversations. And not every idea is a legitimate idea that deserves to be lifted up and honored in the space of, of discourse. There's some ideas that themselves do violence to the space of public discourse. And so we have to both lift up the idea that we can grow from hearing perspectives that make us uncomfortable, from seeing things in a different way, and, and honoring and lifting up that maybe one day my opponent's view might become convincing to me because we might change and evolve. And at the same time, avoid the kind of both sideism or both siderism that's that's really taken over our public discourse today, in which we can't even condemn voices that are so extreme and so violent and so repugnant that actually endanger certain people's lives and really steal certain people's dignity. And so I think that's part of the challenge of this moment, learning how to lift up debate and at the same time recognizing where the boundaries really are when it starts to jeopardize other people's sense of, of, of real safety and dignity. Um, so my Jewish education uh, is lacking but it may be a little bit better than, than others who are hearing. So when we talk about the Talmud, we're talking about the, the commentary around the, the Torah, the first five uh, books of the Hebrew Bible. And, then, and often it's, it's written in the, um, a kind of a circle around the text. You'll see each of the, of the varying points of different uh, rabbis, different teachers in that tradition. So when I hear you talking about setting the boundaries in some ways, the visual of the, of the Talmud is um, all of those boundaries around what's known and what's knowable and what's disputable um, uh, right there when we see it, which is going to be quite remarkable. In your work with your congregation, I'm sure you have um, uh, uh, congregants who have differing political views. How do you approach that political difference within your congregation? Well, I think one of the things that we work really hard to do is distinguish between partisan disagreement and moral disagreement. I do think that there's room for good and decent people to disagree about the details of certain policies and the most effective or productive way to make sure that everybody who needs health care is able to access health care, for example. I do think that it's possible for good and decent people to have real differences on the intricacies of tax policy, for example. But what we just learned this past week is that now there are 666 migrant children who have not been reunited with their parents who were separated at the border for them when, from them when they came here more than two years ago. And we have no idea if these children will ever be found by their parents again. That's not a partisan disagreement. That's a moral disagreement about what is just in a society and what's not. To uphold democratic principles about peaceful transition of power, that should not be a partisan dispute. That's a moral argument to, to condemn violence and, 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 and be able to legitimate the power of, of political institutions which are established in order, to, in order to protect people from violence. Those things should not be um, disputes that are considered partisan disputes. And so part of what we try to do is listen to each other and listen deeply, but also put forward what our core values really are. And at the center of the conversation, in our community is the, is the idea of human dignity. There's a, there's a very powerful midrash, a rabbinic teaching, again, from almost 2000 years ago, that says that when a person walks down the street, there's a crowd of angels that surrounds that person, a thousand angels who blows, the, the angels are blowing trumpets and they're sounding horns and they're saying, make way for an image of the Holy One is coming. Imagine if we lived in a world in which we treated every single person as though she or he or they were actually an image 
of the Holy One. How, how then could we bear to live with poverty, with police violence, with, with all kinds of corruption and heartache? How could we bear it? And so what we try to do is to focus on the, the core foundational question about what does it mean to build a society in which we take the notion of human dignity as the most essential promise, most foundational promise, and then build and understand that we might have different ways of trying to achieve that promise, but we all hold that basic foundational truth. And when someone doesn't, when someone works to undermine that foundational truth, say by deliberately creating a zero tolerance policy that would tear children out of the arms of their parents, then we must speak out against it. And that is not because we're partisans. That's because we are people of faith who believe that we have a moral obligation to stand up for what is just and right. I remember two years ago hearing the, the tape on NPR of those children crying for their mothers. And I, 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 I wept for what seemed like forever. Um, can I, uh, let me ask you a, a, a question that, that pushes on this a little, a little further. Um, some folks imagine that some of us are made more in the image of God than others. Uh, and that there are all kinds of uh, supremacy uh, that emerge from that view that some of us are more like God or more like more human on the other end than that than others. We have seen that um, quite frighteningly uh, with the rise of anti-Semitism, anti both in terms of violence, like at Squirrel Hill. Um, but also in terms of rhetoric, uh, in terms of um, vandalism. And looking at America, I will say, I never thought that um, we would be at the point where we are right now with information we see from the FBI and, and, uh, and other sources. Could you speak a little bit to the rise of anti-Semitism in, in the United States? and to what some of the root causes may be and how we can work together to fight it? Yeah, I, I'm, I am with you. I mean, I never in my life imagined that we would live to see a time in which Nazis would be marching on U.S. soil and actually take the life of an innocent person and then the president of the United States would equivocate in condemnation and, and ultimately signal in pretty significant and profound ways that this is in some way acceptable in, in America today. I think it's really important to know that the rise in anti-Semitism that we've seen over the course of the last five years is not accidental. I don't want to attribute this to some kind of natural sort of permanent state of the world. It's true that anti-Semitism is not new, that there's a, a long and tortured history of anti-Semitism. Wherever there have been Jews, there's been anti-Semitism. And even when there haven't been Jews, there's been anti-Semitism. But there's a reason that anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States in this moment. And that's because there are politicians whose political power in our time relies on conspiracy theories, and relies on dividing populations and generating fear. That's how they maintain, and that's how they hold on to their power. And both of these impulses, the conspiracy theory impulse and the dividing populations and generating fear impulse, both of those have led to this rise in anti-Semitism and, and a rise in, in an embrace of ideas that should be so far from our mainstream and yet have, because of social media and because of the incredible platform that they've been given, because of their acceptance from the highest offices, ha have really brought these radical ideas to the forefront in our country today in a way that's extremely worrisome and very dangerous. Um, you might be familiar with the teaching, uh, with the writings of Eric Ward uh, from Western states. He's, he's an African-American man who embedded with white nationalists for some time in order to try to understand what was at the heart of white nationalism. And what he's shown us over the course of the last couple of years has absolutely 
taken my breath away. This is something that I, as a, as a rabbi, as a Jewish leader, didn't really even understand until Eric Ward helped us understand it, which is when those protesters in Charlottesville were chanting, Jews will not replace us. And even on CNN, you might, maybe you remember, I mean, I remember sitting on my couch that night and watching images of these protesters with the tiki torches and hearing them say, Jews will not replace us. And then hearing the newscasters say, these men are, are chanting, you will not replace us. And I thought, uh, they're not saying you will not, they're saying Jews will not, but I didn't understand why. And Eric Ward explained to us that the reason why is because anti-Semitism plays a really foundational and fundamental role in the white nationalist movement. It's an incredibly racist role that it plays, of course, but the idea is that Jews are the ultimate devil. This is European style anti-Semitism. Like this is old, this is old, Christian, European, uh, Nazi-style anti-Semitism. And the idea is that the Jews are controlling the levers of power and, and manipulating African-American, manipulating black, black and brown communities and people in the United States in their own assertion that they deserve to have political rights. And, and there's, a, there's what happens when when this is at play in the country and is not immediately marginalized, sidelined, silenced, but instead lifted up and given a platform is that we see it quickly moves from a very dangerous idea to real acts of violence. And that's why we saw this attack um, that happened in Pittsburgh. We saw another attack in Chabad, in Poway. Um, we see a tremendous amount of fear throughout the Jewish community around the country but what's really important is that the targeting of the Jewish community is part of the same kind of sickness, the same machinery that, that is also leading to the targeting of black and brown communities. These hatreds are all interwoven and interconnected. And we have to remember that there are people who are benefiting from this. It's not just naturally coming to the surface because every 70 years or so, there's a kind of venomous hatred of the Jew that can't stay under, you know, subterranean and starts to emerge. It's because people are profiting from this idea and they are benefiting from it. And in fact, their political power rests on the very divisive theory that if you can scapegoat certain vulnerable minority populations and turn them against each other, then you can continue to rise in power. And that's what we're seeing in this moment. And that's what I think is in some ways most terrifying about the era that we're living in right now. Rabbi Browse, that's um, disturbing, um, but there's there's something that I, I, I just wanted to laser in on for, for one minute, which was when you first started talking, you were connecting the idea of the conspiracy theory to anti-Semitism. And I just wanted to, to uh, raise that for a moment, because when we look back at things like the Dreyfus Affair, when we look at, at the history of blood libels, and uh, certainly in Europe, but also uh, in the United States, the idea that there is a Jewish conspiracy that there's something hidden, something occult about Judaism, which is um, uh, uh, this illegitimate source of power, seems to be so deeply connected with anti-Semitism that the, the idea that there's a, um, a QAnon conspiracy, the idea that there are Jews controlling the media, the idea that it's Jewish, all of these stereotypes, it's fascinating that they come down to conspiracy. Do you have thoughts about why conspiracy, but like that yes, it does give power to some people, but why now? What seems to be um, feeding this malignancy? Well, I think it's I, I think that it's rooted in in taking a true sense of disempowerment uncertainty and fear for the future that so many people in America are experiencing and then giving them a scapegoat. I mean, literally yesterday or two days ago, we heard that Soros was behind the election fraud that isn't actually happening, but yet is leading to this current political upheaval of this moment. So what does it mean when you identify one Jew who's a billionaire Jew, who's somehow controlling the levers of the United States government? What is that? What, what do you think that they're actually saying? And I think what it's doing is it's speaking to, in, instead of honoring 
that there's incredible fear in this moment, that there's great uncertainty, that there's economic anxiety, that there's anxiety about, about our health in the midst of a pandemic, that all of this climate change is, is leading to fires and hurricanes and all kinds of fear about the future. And instead of thoughtfully engaging those fears and, and bringing people together to try to work to create real solutions to some of these problems. Instead, it's much easier to identify individuals or groups of people who are responsible for the pain point that you and your immediate family or your church or your community are experiencing right now. And, and it just so happens that Jews are a great scapegoat and, and have been throughout history because there's this whole shapeshifter idea about Jews, because many Jews in the United States are, are, are of Ashkenazi descent, are Jews in white skin, and therefore there's this fear that Ashkenazi Jews at least can blend and can pass as white people, and you don't even know that they're Jews until they come out and, you know, and, and, sh and show the world that, that they, what they actually are. There's this sense that the Jews are a nation apart, never fully assimilating into the dominant culture. So that means that Jews must be holding on to some kind of special secret power um, that they have. I, I think what's important is that when people feel vulnerable, they look for uh, they look for a place to put their pain. And responsible leaders will say, "I see that you are hurting." I'm hurting too. Let's work together to see how we can address this economic crisis, to see how we can address this health crisis, this climate crisis. But irresponsible leaders, people who are looking to hold power to, in order to advance their own interests will say, I see that you're in pain and it's the fault of that caravan that's making, it way, making its way through Central America right now and that's landing at our border and they're gonna come here, terrorists and rapists to steal your jobs. And they're being controlled by and paid for by guess who, the Jews. So this is the kind of thinking that, that really irresponsible leadership will use in order to prop up and sustain their own position of power when, in, in, instead of putting forth ideas that could actually help us address some of these root causes. I absolutely, that makes a, um, extraordinary, uh, gives extraordinary clarity to some of the things that we're seeing. The ways in which um, certainly Jews are dehumanized um, and, and anti-Semitic tropes are so wrenchingly stomach turning <laughs> that um, it strikes me that one of the reasons that anti-Semitism works is because we don't even want to see it. Um, and that the level of dehumanization uh, makes us, makes some of us want to close our eyes. So when I was thinking about your TED talk and you were saying that it is the job of the faith leader to put our eyes on what we don't wish to see so that we can see something else, um, I was just struck by that um, way in which reminding us uh, of that dehumanization is so deeply uncomfortable. Um, that even talking about it, it can be hard and we want to turn away from it. So thank you for um, bringing the force of that cruelty and um, lack of humanity into our frame of vision because we can't, we shouldn't um, look away from it. You mentioned um, the, the uh, sense in which uh, Ashkenazi Jews, Jews of largely Eastern European uh, descent, are um, more visible in the United States than say um, Sephardic Jews uh, or uh, Jews from Asia Minor, uh, Northern and Eastern Africa. Um, this has fed into some, some serious political debates uh, here and elsewhere. Uh, so for example, the question that was uh, uh, in is the Israeli census as to uh, whether uh, Sephardic Jews or Jews from uh, uh, Asia Minor were, uh, should be classified differently in the census. And that exposed some um, tensions and some questions about uh, race, skin color, and heritage within both the political world and within um, 
the variety of peoples that make up um, modern day Jews. Could you address a little bit um, these questions of, of race and skin color uh, for uh, Jewish modernity? Not that you represent all of Jewish modernity, but I know you're very active in these questions. Sure, I, I will tell you that because of some really extraordinary research that's been done over the course of the last couple of years by a number of prominent Jews of color and the organizations that they run, we now know that in the United States, somewhere between 12 and 20% of American Jews are Jews of color. And they're not even counting Persian Jews in that, uh, in that calculation. So that means that they're primarily talking about black Jews, they're talking about um, Latin American Jews, they're talking about Asian Jews. And so that's a really interesting and important uh, thing for us to think about because if you look at the leadership, if you look at the top executive leadership and the top board leadership of the major Jewish organizations in the country, it's almost entirely male and it's almost entirely white male or Ashkenazi male. And so what we're learning is that that is, is really not representative of the population. That's also true, by the way, that Israel in Israel, Ashkenazi are not even in the majority of the Jewish population, that there are more Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews, there are more uh, th than there are Ashkenazi Jews. And so I think that this growing um, realization, which comes with a lot of education that our community needs, has the potential of actually transforming our community. There, there are a lot of people doing good work in this space right now. And so we're doing a lot of trainings and a lot of thinking about what does it mean to create leadership pipelines so that our boards of directors of our synagogues, of our federations, of our day schools, etc., actually reflect what the, what the Jewish population of this country really looks like. And, and I've said to my board, if we look out at the room of people who come to services at Ikar on any given Shabbat, and 12 to 20% of the people in the room are not people of color, then we have failed to do our job. Then we've failed to be as welcoming and as inclusive as we should be, because those Jews are there. They're just not coming into our communal spaces because they don't feel welcome in those spaces. And so there's a lot of um, there's, a, there's a lot of sensitivity that, that's growing around this right now, and this really is a time for racial justice and inclusion to be at the forefront. And some of the work that we've been doing is saying that we as a Jewish community need to not only work on racial justice as a core foundational commitment of our community and take to the streets and, and, and be part of, of Black Lives Matter movements and clergy for Black Lives and rabbis for Black Lives and participate in this massive moment of moral awakening that's happening in our country, which we've frankly been part of for years, but is really coming to the forefront now. But we have to get our own houses in order. We have to look at the ways in which we ourselves have failed to create environments that feel safe, that feel truly welcoming and inclusive. And so what are the standards that we want to hold ourselves to? Um, in, the, in, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, one of the really interesting, um, what, one of the interesting conversations that came to the forefront was precisely this, an internal conversation within the Jewish communal establishment about the ways in which we continue to fail Jews of color in creating truly inclusive spaces. And, uh, and a number of young Jews of color established a, a set of, um, of priorities, of goals that we should strive to in the, in the course of the next four years so that we have 20% of our boards, 20% of our leadership, real, of our, uh, and of also of our, um, of our executive teams that, that really reflect the, uh, the, the voice and, and the leadership of that demographic uh, in our community. And it's something that we take very, very, very seriously. And there's a lot more work that needs to be done here. So um, thank you very much for that, uh, that perspective, which I think is, is very far from uh, the view of, of, of many of, uh, of modern uh, jewelry. Now, one of the, the questions that, I, that continually, I, um, I think, has been politically pressing and the U.S. Um, is the putative relationship between um, Zionism as a uh, dream of a Jewish homeland uh, and many other dimensions of Zionism, which I'd ask you to, to, um, uh, to pull out for us, 
and the claim that Zionism and racism are equivalent. Would you uh, comment on that? Yeah, I think one of the things that's very hard in conversations about Zionism today and about Israel today is that we're using the same words, but we mean very different things by those words. And unfortunately, most of these conversations are occurring in spaces where people are not listening to each other. And so we don't engage long enough to, to hear and recognize that we're using these words in profoundly different ways. So, so let me talk about Zionism first from a Jewish perspective and from a Zionist perspective, if I may. So Zionism is the idea that after, that after centuries, after millennia of exile, a people who's been persecuted and oppressed and displaced and exiled and, um, and has survived genocide and multiple genocidal attempts longs for and deserves safety and security and a home where we can protect ourselves and our children from whatever the forces are external to our immediate community. But Zionism is not only the idea of a refuge for the Jewish people, it's also the idea that there should be a place in the world in which, in which Judaism can take center stage in the public, sp public space, in which Jewish people can have agency over their own lives, especially after 2000 years of displacement and exile and oppression and persecution and genocide. It, it, a place in which core foundational Jewish ideas, which stem from our ancient text and have developed and evolved over the course of thousands of years, should exist in a place where they can truly flourish. So, so Zionism, to people who hold Zionism sacred, their, Zionism can mean many, many different things, but I think these are two of the most prominent definitions uh, or drivers of what Zionism is. The idea of a safe haven, a refuge where a people that's never really found a home elsewhere um, for, for a length of time, always for small snippets of time, but not a permanent home elsewhere, could actually live in self-determination and in that place, could exhibit the kind of agency that would allow us to manifest our core values as center stage. Now, that's what Zionism's always meant to me. But I only realized when I started talking to Palestinian friends that that's not what Zionism means to them, that they have a very different understanding of what Zionism is. That Zionism, which I see as a national liberation movement and an opportunity for my people oppressed to, to, to live in full dignity, is, is from the perspective of many Palestinian people, Zionism is the movement that is responsible for the displacement of and the violence toward and the continued oppression of their families. And, and, and Zionism is the, is the ideology that's responsible for taking away the rights and dignities of, of, of millions of people. Now, we can stand opposite each other on College Walk and scream at each other about Zionism, but if we don't sit down and actually talk about it and, and try to approach each other from a place of empathy, then we don't understand that those words mean fundamentally different things. And one person says Zionism is violence, and the other person says, no, it's not. Zionism is freedom, and, and we can't see eye to eye. But what strikes me that's so, so profound about this conversation is that it's precisely my encounter with and understanding of Jewish history that makes me most sympathetic toward and empathic toward my Palestinian friend's desire for self-determination. It's because I'm a Jew and I deeply connect to my own Jewish history that I understand that aching need and desire for Palestinians to live in full dignity and to have full freedom and rights the same way that my people yearned to have that for so many hundreds of years in exile and displacement. And so I believe that there is a way for us to find our way toward one another. And often when I hear Palestinians speak about their, about their suffering and about their struggle, I often have this thought, you know who's really well suited to understand that struggle? The Jews, because of what we've been through. I, I feel like my own story is what opens up my heart to the immense unjustifiable suffering that the Palestinian people continue to endure to this day. 
And so the question is, can we find our way to each other so that together we can honor the trauma and the suffering and the humiliation and the degradation that each of our people has experienced and, and together build a different kind of future? I'm struck listening to you by um, the way in which the stories of refugees have a um, fundamental similarity to them, um, that sense of displacement and loss. And um, every single refugee whom I've met, and I never quite realized that my grandmother was a refugee from, from the Klan in the 1920s, every single story sounds the same insofar as there's one thing that you, is unforgivable. There's one loss that's unforgivable in the stories that I've heard. And it's not always the loss that you think, but there's something that someone took from you that can never be replaced. Uh, and sometimes it's a symbolic thing, a small possession. Sometimes it's a person. Sometimes it's a location. Sometimes it's, it's home itself. But there's one unforgivable loss, um, if not more. But it, it's so, so powerful that we, we need that. I mean, could we imagine a politics in which each of us is able to access our own core trauma, our own generational trauma, and instead of building walls around ourselves and fortifying, that helps us understand each other's pain more deeply. Because it seems to me that that, I mean, that is one of the most foundational um, challenges that, that Torah offers us, the whole, narrative of Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, which is really the meta-narrative of the Jewish existence. It's the, it's the meta-narrative that starts with the Torah and now, and then for, for hundreds of years, for thousands of years, becomes the cent center of our liturgy, of our calendar, of our experience in the world, of our ritual. And the idea is that through hundreds of years of degradation and oppression and grotesque human cruelty, we are able at, at some point to, to begin the long walk, walk toward freedom. A and we're able to imagine moving from darkness to light, from degradation to dignity, from enslavement to freedom. And the moment we leave the clutches of Pharaoh in Egypt, the first thing that we're commanded is that you should never treat another person the way that you were just treated. And that you should, that you should leave the, corner of, the corners of your field for the hungry because nobody left corners of the field for you when you were hungry in Egypt and that you should create one system of laws for yourself and for the stranger because you were on the other side of, of an unfair system of laws and that you should love the stranger because nobody loved you. And so why is the Torah repeating 36 times, you know the heart of the stranger, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Because I think the Torah understands that our trauma could lead us naturally to close our hearts to others, or it could lead us to open our hearts to each other. And I'm so moved by what you just described about the, the idea that there's one, there's one thing, there's one grave injustice that ends up being a tipping point or a turning point for us. What if our memory of that experience then opens our hearts to each other's pain and allows us to hold each other with love and with grace and instead of with anger and with a kind of righteous sense of our own victimhood. But, but instead we take our victimhood and allow it to, to be the force that helps us dream together of a different kind of reality. And that there's a power to claiming um, shared humanity on the other side of trauma. That when you walk into that, that moment of grace, as you, as you so um, beautifully put it, that there is something that we all can grasp and that it's not just mine not just yours, it's, it can be ours. Um, it's very powerful. So can you, I know that, that uh, you and your congregation have done work uh, within Israel, bringing um, Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews together, bringing uh, those in uh, uh, um, uh, settlements and, and throughout uh, the West Bank and elsewhere. Could you tell us a little bit about the work that you have done uh, and both on the political side, on the healing side, uh, on the, the thought side of, of bringing people together? Yeah, I, I really want my community 
to understand the significance of the state of Israel to the Jewish people. Um, I want my kids to understand the miracle of the state of Israel, what it means that um, that the, the idea of self, of Jewish self determination that that this is not something that we should ever take for granted, and I really want my community to understand that we must never get complacent. The same way that in America, I see it as my patriotic duty to take to the streets and protest against unjust policies that this government is pursuing and has been pursuing in my name. So too, it's our obligation and our responsibility to speak out and to offer criticism and to fight with everything we've got to, to, to work for the transformation of the reality on the ground so that all people can live in full dignity and with full rights there. And, 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 so, and I think also, as a, especially as a, as a Jewish community and as a Jewish leader, we have to be very careful not to step out of this conversation, which ends up creating a kind of moral vacuum in which you don't have Jewish faith leaders speaking about Jewish power and the power of the Jewish state and the role of Jewish of, of the of the Jewish state and policies of the Jewish state in oppressing a minority community, because we're afraid to engage in that conversation because we think that it will mean that then our children won't love Israel. Instead, we have to find our moral clarity and and speak as a form of of patriotism, loyalty, and commitment to help the state of Israel realize its own greatest aspirations, which are articulated in the Declaration of the Establishment of the State of Israel. And so what I tried to do is introduce that idea of the preciousness and the miraculousness of the state to my people, and also the extraordinary amount of work that needs to be done for us to actually have built the society in which Jewish values are on the center stage. Because sometimes I look at what's happening in the state of Israel and some of the policies that are put forward by, by these right-wing ultranationalist government, governments, and I do not recognize my Torah. I do not recognize my faith in, in, in the implementation of policies that are causing great harm and great human suffering. And so what do I do as an American Jew? I look for, I look for Israeli Jews and Palestinian citizens of Israel and Palestinians who are in Palestine, who are doing the work, whose voices I can amplify and help support so that Americans understand that neither of these peoples is going away. It's not like all the Jews are gonna pick up and go to New York, and it's not like all the Palestinians are gonna end up you know, just, just going, you know, crossing the border and making a happy home in Jordan. This is a kind of sick fantasy that I think people on both sides of this conversation have held for many years. Nobody's going away. And so how can we learn how to live together? How can we lift up and affirm the centrality of democracy and civil society? How can we lift up education and public safety? How can we think about the real needs of the people addressing poverty, ending occupation, thinking about ways of building a kind of future that really is a shared society in, in which all people are able to live without fear and in full dignity. And there are so many organizations and individuals that are doing tremendous work here. And so I really lift up the work of the New Israel Fund, which supports many of these, uh, many of these organizations. Think about Sikui, which is working so hard to really establish a foundation for multiracial democracy in the state of Israel. Um, there's the Parent Circle and the Bereaved Families Forum. These are people whose children or immediate family members died in conflict, and they have come together in order to build a different kind of future for their children. These are Palestinians and Israeli Jews who are so deeply connected to the idea that together they can imagine a different kind of future. I think about combatants for peace. There, when we were when we were recently in Israel. With our community trip a couple of years ago, we um, we went on a, a we, we went out to meet folks from Combatants for Peace, and we sat and spent the afternoon with a man who was a former combatant, part of Hamas, and he spoke to us about his journey and about what led him to believe that violence was the only response, 
and how he's evolved from that place to recognize that you just can't get rid of everybody. So you have to find a way to live together. And we talked to Israeli soldiers who told us similar, similarly about their commitment to lifting up the rights and dignities of the Palestinian people. There are many extraordinary people who are doing incredible work there. And I think our job and what would be most helpful for Americans to do in this conflict is instead of demonizing from the outside, looking for ways to lift up and amplify the voices of the people on the ground who are really in the struggle every single day, who are doing the hard work of, of lifting up these, these struggles and trying to find a way to live in shared society together. A very profound uh, point, Rabbi. Uh, I'm, I'm drawn back a, a, a minute. Um, to a student I was speaking with a couple of years ago. Um, we have a, um, a love of the number 47 at Pomona. It's a long and complicated story, uh, but recently started celebrating 47 day as a day of service. And uh, we had a student who woke up uh, to hear the sounds of joyous laughter outside her, her room and she was all um, suddenly feeling completely dissociated from it because uh, April 7th, 1993 was the beginning of the Rwandan genocide. And so for her as a Rwandan, um, that's a day of remembrance. And we held a small commemoration here two years ago in which um, extraordinary speaker uh, came and said, if people who watched their children be being killed can speak to their neighbors, who are we to be proud that we can speak across political parties? And it's just, you know, when you are the group that you're talking about with the families um, who have lost children to this, um, but people who have fought uh, and have given up uh, combat for peace, if they can do that, who are we <laughs> to, um, to either dismiss uh, that uh, hard work um, or, to, uh, or to congratulate ourselves on, on being able to live next to someone of a different political party? Uh, I, it's a certain, there's a certain hubris there. Um, one of the things that, I, that I'm struck with often when I, I speak to um, Jewish students is the challenge of defending their their love of Israel and the importance that Israel plays in that broader sense of Zionism that you senses of Zionism that you discussed and and also just the fact when you you know when I walk into um, a synagogue on a Shabbat or a, a holiday or or a, a celebration you know Israel is so central within liturgy um, that it's it's the celebration of Israel is so deeply, Israel as an idea is so deeply interconnected with the history of Judaism, um, the, the, the language of worship um, uh, for Jews, that when people hear, when Jews that I, uh, with whom I speak, hear this, this conflation of Zionism and Israel with, with racism, um, it feels like anti-Semitism by another name. Um, as I, we talked about it one of the, yeah, so if these things keep happening to you because you, when you are in the, in the act of being Jewish, worshiping, <laughs> celebrating, um, uh, and when people call out um, Zionism as racism while you are doing that, it starts to feel like it's about you as a Jew, not about the policies of a government somewhere. Could you talk about that that sense that, especially I know this is a lot of young younger Jews I see, that torsion and that sense of, of divided so much that they say, I'm not agreeing with everything that Israel says, but but becomes the very first thing out of a, a student's mouth. And I feel so terrible when I hear that. I'm like, you don't need to say that. You don't need to disavow Israel every time you say you're a Jew. Um, <laughs> could you talk about that pull that seems so visceral yeah, I mean, some, unfortunately, in some ways now, in some spaces, you do have to lead with that. I mean, we have 
we have reached a point now where Jews who do not lead with their disavowal of the state of Israel are not welcome in um, certainly in, in, in many progressive spaces. And I have to say, I've been in racial justice work um, my whole adult life, really. Um, and I've seen, I've seen it a lot. Um, I don't believe that, I don't believe that, um, that all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. And some criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. And so I think what we have to do is create the space for a conversation in which people can be very critical of Israeli policy and not be accused of being anti-Semites. And in which, in which even from within the Jewish community, there is some script breaking that's happening where we too speak openly about our concerns about Israeli policy. Um, and it's clear that that comes from a place of love because I'll tell you, it's not only, um, you know, out there in the world, but also even when rabbis um, speak critical words about Israel, um, it's risky. One of my colleagues years ago coined the phrase, the death by Israel sermon, which is, you know, you're a young rabbi and you got your first pulpit and everything's going great until you give your first uh, sermon and you mention the word occupation and you're done. And in some ways, this is something I've worked very, very hard to try to shift the, the conversation on um, because, because in my community, thank God, I, I am very supported by a board that understands that you actually want your faith leaders to be moral leaders and you want them to say things, even if those things make you uncomfortable. And so I have the flexibility to sort of stretch the boundaries of conversation in some ways. And I feel I must because we have to be able to speak critically and also lovingly at the same time. And, I, it, and it feels to me really self-defeating to create kind of litmus tests for Jewish activists uh, and Jewish participants in racial justice spaces that if you hold and affirm any connection to the state of Israel, you're not welcome in this fight. Um, that feels really self-defeating for me, especially in a time when what we're confronting on the other side of this is white nationalism, is Nazism, is potential coup. I mean, what we're talking about right now is so dangerous and so profound that we have to find a way to see and hear and understand each other and work together toward a different kind of future. And it feels really self-defeating to me. So I, I wanna take some responsibility for this in the Jewish community because we have not done a great job of cultivating a landscape of open-hearted engagement on Israel where people could legitimately bring their concerns, bring their moral quandaries and lift them up and be heard. And so as a result, it seems like the Jewish community has been silent. And so if you go outside the Jewish community, that's where the, that's where the criticism is found. Um, we're working on this. A lot of progress has been made. There are more and more rabbis and communal leaders who are taking their congregations on uh, encounter trips into the West Bank, speaking with Palestinians, hearing about their struggles, deeply engaging. Um, I brought my community to, on a Breaking the Silence tour of Hebron, where, um, where Israeli uh, former par paratroopers actually walked us through the streets of the Kasbah and explained to us what was happening on the ground and helped us understand exactly what was at stake in, in this moment. There's a lot of growth that's happening in this moment. Um, and, and I think we have to we have to find a way to find ourselves on the same side of history. And it can start with some very basic questions. Like, do you believe that I have a right to live without fear? Because I believe that you have a right to live without fear. Do you believe that I have a right to live with dignity? Because I have a right to believe that you do. Now, what can we do to work together toward the realization of that shared vision? And that feels to me like a much more productive way to be in this conversation rather than to say, you can't enter this space because you have a brother who lives in Israel and therefore, or I once read something that you said, or as, as happened very famously um, up north, you, you once posted, um, someone, someone who uh, owns a cafe posted um, a, some, a, a tweet celebrating Israel on Israel's 70th birthday and then was deemed a terrorist. And there were activists protesting in front of his place for several years afterwards. 
this is not productive and not helpful. And, and, and you know, you asked me earlier as we were talking about anti-Semitism, one of the ways that anti-Semitism thrives is that Jews are isolated from the rest of the population. And, and by the way, this is really the way that many forms of racism thrive. That, that, that part of the sickness of racism is it turns people against each other. But anti-Semitism thrives when Jews are isolated from other people. And when I see that happening in, in my own progressive circles, when I see that Jews are being isolated from the work that is so core and foundational to who, to who Jews are and what our, who our tradition uh, calls us to be, it's very painful and it's also self-defeating and unhelpful because the real work of what needs to be done in this country, the work of real racial reckoning that has to happen, the work of economic justice, of climate justice, of racial justice, we're, we're gonna need to build coalitions that are complicated and messy and where it doesn't always fit exactly right. And in order to do that, we have to find a way to hear each other and to see each other and to know that we're not going to see each other exactly the same way. We're not going to see the facts on the ground even the same way, but we're going to hold each other with empathy and with some love. I, I, I will share with you that I heard a talk years ago that was for me absolutely transformative. It was a Palestinian professor who came to speak at a synagogue in Santa Monica, and I had just moved out for, um, from New York to Los Angeles, and I was a young rabbi. And I went to hear him speak. And I have to tell you that I don't remember anything that he said, except for his opening. He was in the front of a room that was packed with about 250 Jews. And he said, I want to tell all of you what happened in 1948 from my perspective. And I know that some of what you hear today from me is going to be incredibly painful for you because it's gonna contradict your narrative from your family of what happened in 1948. And you're gonna get so angry, he said, you're gonna to wanna to jump over the pews and strangle me at some point. But I'm asking you to just sit and listen and hear what I'm telling you happened from my perspective. Because if we are ever going to work together towards some kind of shared existence, we are going to have to learn how to hear each other. And so when the, I, I, that changed me. I have to say that changed me. It was um, maybe almost 20 years ago. And I thought, my God, he's right. We don't know how to listen to each other because we feel so vulnerable. We're so afraid. We, and we don't want to feel shame. I don't want to feel like my family hurt you. And so we place all these barriers and, and we actually aren't able to hear each other. But there is a way forward. And I think of the work that Brian Stevenson's been doing at the Equal Justice Initiative and at the Legacy Museum. And what he's saying is the only way that we can heal as a nation is through telling the truth. And, and you can't enter that conversation denying everything because you don't want to experience shame. You have to let leave the shame in the other room and close and lock the door and enter the conversation and recognize where those profound moral failures have been, the ways in which we are all culpable, and then start to do the hard work of rebuilding. And if we expect that work to happen here, how can we not expect that the same work needs to happen over there and is able to happen over there? So I absolutely look at this as an opportunity for transformation that's rooted in truth-telling. It's rooted in not being afraid to say what's true I went to the Kalandia checkpoint. I, I saw the incredible humiliation that tens of thousands of Palestinians have to go through every day in order to stick to work. And it broke my Jewish heart. And I can't deny that. And I don't wanna deny that because it's my responsibility. And I have to be a partner in working toward the resolution of this conflict, in, in working to find a better way for our people to, to learn how to live together. If I care about Israel and my brother and his family and the, and the future of the Jewish people and the future of the Jewish state, then I have to be as invested in resolving Kalandia Checkpoint as any Palestinian would be in resolving Kalandia Checkpoint. Rabbi Braus, um, you have shared some powerful words uh, and thoughts with us. And 
And what you just said, one of the things that I heard most strongly, um, if we go back to the, to the idea of being vulnerable, that comes from the Latin word vulnus, which is a wound. There's no shame in being wounded. Um, there's shame, perhaps, in being unwilling to, sh unwilling to share in healing. Um, and what we have to do is to be vulnerable enough that we can share our healing with each other. And I want to thank you very, very much for sharing um, the sense of vulnerability that, that comes with caring for the world, um, sharing the depth of your commitments to faith and justice with our community, and my gratitude uh, to you for bringing that um, uh, to Pomona uh, and, and, and to the world. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I would like to just say our next dialogue is going to be in March. You're welcome to tune in. Uh, it is, uh, we'll welcome Imam Khalid Latif, uh, who's university chaplain and director of the Islamic Center at NYU. Uh, he also has been a leader both in his own faith and in spreading um, uh, that sense of shared vulnerability and shared healing across faiths. And uh, I hope to see everybody then. Again, um, Rabbi, thank you for teaching us uh, and for sharing yourself with us today. Uh, be well. <laughs>